uh, uh, say if it is possible to lead in prayer? Not if, okay. Yes, Pastor. Yes, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Let us pray. Our dear Father in heaven, we bless you and we thank you, Lord, for another opportunity, Lord, to be instructed by your daughter. And thank you, Lord, for giving us this opportunity, Lord, to be gathered all over the world online here again, Lord, to learn at your feet. We thank you because of the wisdom, Lord, that will be impacted with and the understanding and the knowledge. We pray, Father, at the time, Lord, we are together, let it be fruitful. Lord, we pray as we um, listen, as we pay attention, oh God, speak to us, Lord, through everything we'll be learning today. And above all, Lord, may we be used for your glory. May we be used as instruments to bring light to those who do not understand, Lord, um, the, the, the concepts of your word, oh Lord, the concepts of the apostolic and the, uh, the prophetic in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for in Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Siri. Um, so we will get into what we have been looking at so far, and that is about um, receiving personal prophecy. What are all the things that we should think about, and how should we assess those prophecies before we actually consider acting on it and that's what we looked at we said that we have to first test whether the prophecy is from god and there were a couple of tests um, and first of all you know we should never despise a prophecy you know, the moment you hear a prophecy uh, the the right way to approach it is to say okay you know we will consider i will consider this and then go ahead and test that prophecy don't reject it uh, you know right at the outset that go ahead and test that prophecy, uh, test it for you know whether it is in harmony with the written word of God, whether it moves uh, me towards God and his will for my life. Then we ask the question, does the Holy Spirit bear witness to this prophecy with my spirit? Uh, we also check you know whether uh, it is in harmony with the overall plan and purpose of God for my life. So if it satisfies all, all of these questions, then we know that this is a word from God and uh, we take the next step. And yesterday I was saying that another crucial thing is to uh, know how to apply it because every word doesn't mean that God wants us to act on it right away. So there can be a passage of time involved and this can uh, be a few years, it can be many years uh, and in that duration one needs to know what is it that uh, they should be doing in order to prepare themselves for that, you know, the Kairos movement or the right time when we have to step out with the prophecy. So you know, God generally gives us this period of time and uh, uh, it's it's for our benefit. So uh, some insights regarding this duration and the process that one uh, goes through before the fulfillment of the prophet, prophetic word. Uh, one is that we must believe in that prophetic word. You know, as we go through that period, we must have our uh, hope and faith in that prophetic word because uh, we we saw how Second Chronicles 20, 20, God says, believe in the Lord your God and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and you shall prosper. So there is a blessing uh, as we believe in what God has already spoken. Now, if we have an attitude uh, which is like, okay, I don't, I don't think this is from God and I, I'm not going to believe this. That's when, you know, we are uh, not aligned with what God is doing in our life. So uh, take that prophetic word. Now that it is confirmed that it's from God, believe in it, believe in it. The next thing is to uh, obey that word. So uh, whatever is it, it takes, you know, you go ahead and uh, do that. You know, God could be revealing different things at different points in our journey. So uh, just, you know, believe it and act on uh, whatever it is that God is 
uh, speaking to us about. And then the prophetic word, you know, during that phase when we are holding on to the prophetic word, one very important thing is to wage spiritual warfare with the word that has been spoken. So 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 18, that's where Paul instructs Timothy to fight a good warfare with the prophetic word which has been spoken over his life. Now, I think this is very important because what happens is many of us think that when a prophetic word is spoken, uh, it is supposed to be automatic. You know, the, that, okay, uh, this, this word came that God is going to whatever, fill in the blanks, you know, uh, God is going to um, bless prosper me uh, in a in a great job or god is going to give me a successful ministry so all that is there but in the phase when you don't see the full manifestation <coughs> there are people i've heard them say if god said it um you know that settles it and that's it you know i'm not going to do anything about the prophetic word but here is something we see in scripture that when a prophetic word is spoken over our lives, we have to use it in prayer. So, you know, we could bring that in prayer and say, God, you have, you said in your word uh, that, you know, you, you spoke to me that you're going to do this in my life. So, you know, I, I stand firm on it. Uh, and as you do that, one thing is that, you know, you are, uh, you are acknowledging, affirming it, but it's also like a declaration to the powers of darkness. So that is why wage a good warfare, you know, that you believe in what God is going to do and what God has spoken over your life. So waging a good warfare is also necessary. Um, we can't just have the prophetic word and uh, think that it'll it'll just happen, you know, by itself. So we are praying it through and uh, using it in spiritual warfare uh, is, is something that we must engage in. And then, you know, uh, we must recognize that God has a due time when he will perform what he has spoken. So until such time, uh, it is good to do what God has shown us right now, you know, and, and uh, um, this is also really important. The example that I gave yesterday, where I said uh, someone comes and says that God is going to uh, take you to the nations and you have an international ministry and all of that. So even though such a word has come and maybe I have prayed through and I have a confirmation that it is a true word and what do I do now you know, with that word? The best thing to do is to um, hold on to God in prayer and see how he leads us into the next step. And while we are waiting for that, maybe currently I already have a job. Maybe currently I already have a ministry. You know, currently, um, you know, I'm already working on some projects. So it's just good to continue what you and I know God has called us to right now. So that is the best thing to do. You know, just continue um, in with what you know while you wait. And... Um, uh yeah prayer one is uh, i already talked about using the prophetic word in spiritual warfare now uh, it's also important for us to pray through the prophetic word now uh, we we see in god's word that there were there were prophecies made and uh, it it took people to spend time in prayer to see the manifestation of that prophecy you know, one example is um uh, in the book of daniel and uh, daniel already knew uh, about the fact that you know the the uh, the people of god would be set free and you know they they will move out of babylon so he knew all these things but then you see that daniel is holding on to this word and he's actually praying about it now if god is anyway going to do it why pray but there is a dynamic of engaging in prayer, which is necessary for the fulfillment of that prophetic word. So no, uh, now if I just ask any one of you, um, you could probably share, you know, a couple of prophetic words uh, over your life, over, you know, your ministry, over your family.
Now, instead of just keeping that in our memory, it's good to start praying it through. And start praying it through. Just the way Daniel. Daniel already knew the prophetic word about the nation. And that was not you know, enough for him to know it. He started praying into it. And uh, that's how you know, the release also came. We also find um, uh, um, a prophet like Elijah. You know, in uh, 1 Kings 18, we saw that God spoke to him. And he already told him it is going to rain. And yet, what does Elijah do? He goes and he starts praying. That's praying about what? Something that God has already confirmed. He's told Elijah, this is it. And it's uh, funny because uh, Elijah, he communicates this to Ahab. And then, you know, he, he goes and prays. So he was sure that he heard from God. It is going to rain. So he could have, you know, he could have just rested after, after declaring it to Ahab. But that's not what he did. He went and prayed and he even prayed seven times. So it was the seventh time when he saw, you know, a small cloud rising up and he knew that this is the timing. It is going to pour now and it's um, best for me to get out of this place. So prayer has a part to play in the manifestation of the prophetic word. And so uh, whenever we receive prophetic words, it's good to pray them through. Then um, God will take us through a necessary process. Now, uh, you know, when we hear great words of prophecy uh, made over our lives or let's say made over our family or you know, sometimes parents, they hear this prophetic word about their child and they're all excited. Oh, wow, God is going to use um, uh, you know, my child mightily. But whenever there is a great word, Okay, also remember that there will be a great preparation in order for us to walk in that word. So God will take us through preparation. Okay. Um, and one has to yield to that preparation to be ready to step into it when uh, things are happening. Now, this is another very, very crucial thing for us to understand. When a prophetic word is spoken, it's generally in part. So uh, a prophet will not address or anyone, you know, anyone, even a prophesying believer will not address every area of a person's life or a person's work. So uh, the prophetic word could only be about ministry. But, you know, it, it's like. It's not that God is not seeing the other parts of this person's life. Maybe God just uh, meant to speak, address one particular area of that individual's life. Okay, so uh, we we must understand that you know prophecy is in part, and God addresses parts in the prophetic word, and uh, we must also remember that when this prophecy comes, it. Uh, it may not speak of everything. And even the unsaid parts have to be considered. For example, let's go back to the same example of, you know, God is going to bless you with an international ministry, this and that. That's what is spoken. Now, what is unsaid? The unsaid part is that one has to yield to God. One has to grow spiritually. One has to um, grow in the grace of God you know, with regard to the gifts that are there on their lives. So that is unspoken, but it is equally important, like the spoken word. So this is, you know, something that we have to uh, recognize. Just because God didn't say it through that prophecy, uh, we can't ignore or neglect it. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about understanding timing in personal prophecy. And I've been saying that... Uh, God's appointed time is, is the moment when things will um, materialize or it will happen. So one has to wait for it, God's appointed time. When we think about God, you know, God lives outside of time. He is not, you know, his uh, calculation of time is completely different from ours. The scripture also says that uh, a day is like a thousand years, you know, and, uh, for, for God. So uh, his way of looking at time is quite different. 
and uh, in a prophetic word you know we can see uh, we I mean, we can see examples in God's um, uh, word that there have been words that were spoken, but it was in God's time that they came to fruition. For example, uh, early on in Genesis, we read how a man will crush the head of the serpent. You know, the, the woman's seed will crush the head of the serpent. But in Galatians 4, 4 is when, you know, in the fullness of time, uh, God sent the Lord Jesus. So it took those many thousand years for Jesus to come. And similarly, the word spoken to Abraham, you read about his life, Genesis 12, the, the promises uh, all the way through Genesis 15. And then you're ex expected, oh, wow, you know, J Abraham is going to have a son. And uh, this will be a son of promise. But uh, in reality, it took 25 years for that word to be fulfilled. And if we look closely at the promises of God, it also had to do with his descendants. They also have to do with, uh, you know, the uh, the land that God will give them. So the promises were over the generations. So not just Abraham, but also his descendants needed to believe and wait on the Lord for uh, certain parts of God's promise to be fulfilled. So there was a passage of time and a duration. So the same thing, you know, applies uh, to us. Now, in the prophetic word, uh, we could hear words like, um, you know, God, God will do it um, soon, immediately. You know, Jesus is coming back soon, and uh, sometimes gauging what that soon, immediately, the time duration um, is critical. Okay, and we should not assess it as you know our kind of understanding of time so even in the book of revelation we see excuse me revelation 22 12 where god says behold i am coming quickly okay but now we are with you know things unfolding in the world events unfolding in the world where we are moving towards the end of you know this age and it certainly the way we perceive it it is not a quickly it has taken you know years and uh, uh, decades and, and things like that so uh, we have to be open to the way god works and his time and sometimes you know as i've been saying it could take a few years it could take five years 10 years 20 years um, for what God has spoken to actually come to pass. So uh, we must understand that and that will be helpful um, because then we will know how to act on it. You know, we won't make foolish decisions um, uh, like, you know, quitting your job or um, selling everything that you have uh, because God said, you know, you're going to get into uh, you know certain certain way of serving him. So you have to also wait for God's timing and the way God works. Now, uh, when we uh, consider the uh, prophetic in scripture, there is something called as prophetic foreshortening. Okay? Prophetic foreshortening. Isaiah chapter 9 verses 6 and 7. Um, through this, I can, uh, uh, you know, explain what I'm saying. Could somebody pick up that passage and read, please? Isaiah 7. Verses uh, six and seven. Yes, Pastor. Yeah, Isaiah. Isaiah nine. nine. Oh, yeah, my apologies. Yeah. Nine. Isaiah nine, six and seven, correct? Correct, correct. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his kingdom, Sorry, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. 
upon the throne of David over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Sai, for reading it for us. Um, this is a familiar passage. Usually, you know, uh, during Christmas times, people would read it. In this very passage, if you notice, um, I know Isaiah prophesies, he says, um, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And we know that this is talking about the birth of the Lord Jesus. Okay? Now, in the same sentence, Isaiah is saying, the government will be upon his shoulder. Now, we can all testify to the fact that the kind of life that Jesus lived here during his earthly ministry, uh, you know, it, he did not, he was not part of the government or the rulership, you know, in, in uh, that sense. So, yes, he brought the kingdom of God, but like literally for him to, um, uh, to rule as a leader, that, that didn't happen, quite happened then. But when we study scriptures, we understand that this is going to happen, you know, when uh, when we see the end of the age and the, you know, the millennial rule and reign of Christ. And then, you know, you move forward into um, the the other things that, that will occur and it will be Christ exalted, you know, ruling and reigning with the government on his shoulders. So this is a very good example for us because in one breath, there is, you know, there is ages, there's, uh, there is thousands of years, okay? And for somebody who is interpreting, if we don't recognize this, you know, we could be like, but, you know, the word said this and that all in one breath, but the timing of what God is speaking to us, even if it is a part of the same sentence, you know, it, it can be different. Uh, and, and that's what we see here. This is, you know, called as prophetic foreshortening, where the timing is so different of two occurrences. Uh, and for the person who is interpreting, right, um, uh, they would need to recognize this. And uh, this tends to happen in the simple prophetic words that are spoken. Because we are going to use, uh, uh, because we are going to prophesy, over others and also receive prophetic words. You know, just we are just sharing this so that we are aware and uh, we don't get confused. You know, what is God saying? Um, why is it all? You know, one thing is happening one time uh, and something else is happening in another time in my life. Like what is going on? But that's how God speaks, and we have to understand His timing. And uh, say, I saw your point here. Uh, uh, say he has uh, commented God lives in the now yeah that's true so uh, you know that that's how we say it. God lives in the now there's no past or present future um, time is only relative to us here on earth yes that's so right okay all right so uh, yeah some more insights about interpreting personal prophecy and applying personal prophecy so when we make decisions uh, let's be fully aware of the way, you know, the timing of what God is talking to us about. Okay. Uh, if we are not careful, uh, then, you know, we can go through some disappointments. Now, uh, about releasing prophetic words, we will uh, talk about it. But then um, something that I would uh, put right here is, uh, you know, sometimes people are in a hurry to add a time to the word that is spoken. For example, mm, oh, okay, you are going to get married in two months. Okay, so uh, maybe somebody is very excited. Oh, wow, it's going to happen finally. And then a month comes and goes, another month comes and goes, two months have gone. And this person is here, you know, like nothing has happened. So then what happens, you know, the, they go into disappointment that the prophetic word said this timeline and it didn't happen. 
So, you know, using of timeline, even when we prophesy and we generally say that when we teach, uh, you know, this subject, unless God impresses on our hearts you know, very strongly and puts a timeline and says, by the end of the year or in two years or in five years, don't say it. Okay? Best not to say, best not to attach a timeline to the prophetic word. So normally, a, a general um, uh, prophesying believer, uh, we, we would just say, don't add a timeline. Unless you are very, very sure. So we need to exercise caution. Um, otherwise, what tends to happen is, you know, people um, anticipate, they expect, and when it doesn't happen, uh, you know, if it really affects their faith, okay, and we don't want that to happen. So better to avoid adding a timeline. And uh, in the, you know, interpretation of uh, the prophetic word, uh, once again, there's a section here in our notes, I'm on page 170, PDF version, um, about confirmation. So to have a confirmation from one or more witnesses, especially when it is an important prophetic word, you know, um, maybe we've heard from God, it, we have to change our city or, you know, take the family and shift to another place. These are all very, very big decisions. So before we make such a decision based on the prophetic word, generally what happens, uh, we might have an idea. Like God would have already put that in our hearts and uh, you know, we might be thinking, yeah, what if you know, God takes me to another place? And then suddenly the opportunity comes our way, the prophetic word comes our way. So there is a confirmation right there because God had already you know, given us an idea that this is going to happen. But there are times when we don't have an inner witness that God is going to uh, bring about a change in, in our lives. So in those moments, it is best to wait to get confirmations. Okay, now again, don't have to run behind prophets and prophetic conferences, but just put it out before the Lord and say, God, you know, in your own way, please give me a, 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 like a double witness so that I'm sure and I'm ready to make this decision. I'm ready to make the move, but please give me a confirmation. And um, that way, you know, you can be very sure, uh, particularly when you're making a big decision for life. Um, so a few more things about the prof personal prophecies. Um, always check for the inner witness of the word that has been spoken to us, you know, whether um, the Holy Spirit is bearing witness, whether we have a sense of calm in us. Um, uh, you know, uh, that, okay, we can act on this word. Mm, and uh, remember that God is always very consistent. He doesn't um, say something totally new, you know, to derail us. He never does that. So uh, the, prof the prophecy must be consistent, you know, as compared to being very abrupt, like sudden and uh, uh, random. Okay. Then uh, also, the witnesses, if God gives us more witnesses that this is exactly what he is ministering to our hearts, then we have more surety as we act on that word. And sometimes there is also uh, in the Bible we see there is uh, God uses repetition. Okay, there were some dreams, for example, the dream of uh, you know, when you look at Joseph you know, interpreting Pharaoh's dream, um, uh, I think Pharaoh had two dreams, right? And the interpretation was more or less the same. Uh, it was the same, in fact, of both the dreams uh, which Pharaoh had. And God spoke twice. God spoke twice. So sometimes, again, you know, we must not get stuck on it. Uh, we, for the sake of confirmation, if we come before God and say, God, you know, I want you to tell me whether this is from you, you give me a vision. You know, some people pray like that. You only give me a vision, then I'll know. And God is gracious. You know, sometimes he just goes by what we request. However, you know, God can speak any which way. Maybe he speaks through the pastor. Maybe he speaks from the word of God. So if we are open, then 
you know that's better because then god can confirm in uh, you know whichever way but also look out for uh, you know this double happening Re repeatedly god says the same thing uh, and especially when it comes to dreams if you're having the same dream uh, more than once god is trying to get your attention you know, if it is a dream from god so get a confirmation and then act on it especially when making uh, big life decisions okay so while uh, prophesying in a congregation um, uh, again this uh, this thing about confirming the prophetic word uh, or in other words you know maybe confirming is not something that can happen in a uh, in a church service right away but at least to know that this is from god you know the witness that yes this is a prophetic word uh, so in a congregational setup uh, it will be good as paul points out in first corinthians 14 that let everyone speak one by one and let the others judge so when there are other people who can and you know the word judge sometimes that sounds very um, you know it sounds like oh that's tough somebody has to judge um, are they judging the person no, it's to simply judge whether it's coming from the right source, um, you know, and if it is really a prophetic word. So others, you know, being capable of recognizing whether it is a word from God is so helpful. And uh, this must be practiced in a congregational setup when a word is released. Others have the opportunity to um, like assess it and say that okay yeah it is from god all right um okay so there's uh, some reiteration of the same things that we have spoken of but uh, i think it's definitely very helpful um uh, because um, you know we have to remember these things so again there's another section uh, that uh, uh, is reiterating to us that the part that is revealed is important but the part which went unsaid is still important and the example that is given in this section is when you know god says uh, let's say there's an individual who is um, stuck in sin in their lives okay, something something is not right uh, and they know that they have to repent uh, before the lord uh, however when a prophetic word is spoken over their lives maybe god through his mercy chooses to say good things uh, now, this person might hear words like, okay, you know, you are like, you are like Joseph and God is raising you up for a time such as this and, you know, God will use you as a deliverer. So many, you know, good things, nice things. Now, that's the end of the prophetic word. So the person should not think that, oh, everything was good. That means, you know, God is happy with my life. I don't have to change anything. I'm okay. Even um the the fact that i am not leaving my sinful habit it's okay because you know god wants to bless me anyway so how does this work you know god's nature is one of mercy and grace right um and he is long suffering so just because god chose to you know um god decided not to bring up the sin issue the person doesn't mean he's happy with that so the things that are unsaid are as important as the things that are said or revealed and uh, when we we know this you know the uh, sometimes we wait on a prophetic word like it is everything oh if if the prophecy comes um, that's everything i need for my life but not really because what did paul say we see in part we prophesy in part so the prophetic word is just a part and uh, that's how you know uh, like we must be aware of it and also give attention to the things that were unsaid uh, so god's silence about a particular area of life does not imply that he approves of what is going on in that area okay so here's another uh, important insight true prophets also make mistakes now uh, this is uh, uh, you know quite necessary to understand uh, in the subject because what happens is it things tend to be about the accuracy 
of the prophetic word. Now, if somebody said something and, uh, you know, let's say a seasoned prophet, okay, someone has gone through the whole process of prophesying, prophesying and, you know, becoming more sensitive to the voice of God. They're generally correct. They're generally very accurate. If such a person releases a prophecy and it ends up being wrong, now the tendency among God's people or you know believers is, oh, false prophet. Look at this. He uh, he made this uh, statement and it's so wrong. Okay, so we start labeling people as false prophets. But you know, something that we have to recognize is that um, just the way uh, uh, the teacher of uh, God's word, you know, when they are teaching, it's possible that, you know, sometimes their interpretation of the word, they they didn't have a revelation you know, at a certain point in their uh, life. And as they're journeying, uh, you know, in serving God through teaching, they come to a place where they have greater revelation. And at that point, you know, they, they are saying something which is so contradictory to what they were uh, teaching earlier. So we don't we don't label a teacher who said something uh, inaccurate at some point as a false teacher, right? We don't because we just recognize that, okay, you know, so and so um, uh, at certain points, though they were sincere, they ended up teaching the wrong, uh, uh, whatever, truth. They, they taught the truth in a wrong way uh, and we let go of that. So similarly, even when it comes to prophets, uh, and even in the case of apostles, you see that you know Peter. Peter uh, was he knew the truth about salvation, but when it came to um, the Gentiles and the Jews, in fact, God used Peter mightily to go and minister to the Gentiles. You know, he went and ministered to Cornelius, and the gospel went to the Gentiles through through him, but. He was trying to um, keep the Jewish traditions in front of the uh, Jews. And when the Jews were not looking, you know, he was okay with you know, not, not practicing all the Jewish traditions. So Paul rebukes him and he says, what are you doing? Um, uh, being an apostle, this is, this is not how you should be. So there is a correction given to the apostle as well. So even when it comes to the prophet, Okay. There can be times when a sincere, um, you know, a sincere prophetic word can be wrong. Maybe the prophet perceived it wrongly, or even this tends to happen uh, in the prophetic. You know, um, if you recall Jonah, Jonah goes and he prophesies, you know, like fire and um, God, God's wrath. Uh, you better repent. And uh, the, he never expects a sinful community to turn to God but they do and when they do turn you know God changes his mind and Jonah is so upset he's like God how could you do this to me you asked me to pronounce judgment and here you are giving your mercy to the people so what will the people think about me they'll think I am a false prophet because I said judgment is coming okay so even this can happen uh, when people respond particularly words of judgment and you know, words of uh, um, like correction and things like that, uh, there can be, you know, God can, and please note that it is within his nature. He's not doing something completely different from who he is, but within, given his nature of mercy and grace, he is accommodating of you know, people and their response in a given moment. So God finally did not judge them the way Jonah had proclaimed. So even that can happen. And when that happens, again, people start saying, oh, false prophet, he said that, uh, he or she said that, you know, judgment is going to come and nothing like that has happened. So uh, before labeling someone, you know, as a false prophet, you know, we really have to uh, think about it. Um, yeah. Now, who is a false prophet? Well, it's not just a wrong prophetic word here and there that makes one a false prophet. Uh, but as we read, you know, Jesus also said, like, you shall know them by their fruit. So look for the fruit of their life. 
look for the fruit of their ministry is it uh, is that ministry or the life of that individual drawing uh, people closer to god so if that is happening and then there are these stand alone one or two you know wrong prophetic words then we can't label the individual as a false prophet and the bible also has a lot to say about you know uh, false prophets and especially during the end times uh, john apostle john writes about the spirit of antichrist now uh, peter apostle peter describes uh, uh, you know the people who are like this you know, false prophets and teachers who take people away from from god and there are certain characteristics that are also uh, described that they are you know covetous they exploit they use deceptive words um and uh, yeah so they bring about destruction their ways are destructive you know they are proud they are not um respectful of the word of god or you know what god is doing so there are many characteristics that have been given there for us for us to uh, you know understand a false prophet through these things so just wrong prophecies shouldn't uh, you know uh, like we shouldn't use that to tag people as a false prophet and uh, surely god is raising up in the times given now he is raising up uh, many people and we can on we must in fact pray that due during this time that there will be many prophets who will rise up because uh, you know this is the age isn't it the fivefold ministry offices god is restoring them uh, back to the body of christ so uh, we want to see more prophets we want to see more apostles we want to see more uh, good teachers evangelists pastors rise up because the anointing is available uh, and you know that that must be our prayer uh and when it comes to the prophets of god uh we shouldn't be quick to judge them because there are also scriptures like first chronicle 1622 which says do not touch my anointed ones and do my prophets no harm so uh god takes his prophets seriously and uh, you know he takes care of them uh, as well so we must be very careful before we and make statements like this about you know the the people that god has anointed and appointed so with that we come to um, the next chapter here on interpreting dreams if there are no questions then i'll just you know go forward with the the dreams chapter okay it seems like uh, everything is quite clear there so yeah uh, we'll talk about dreams we have a few minutes that's all right so dreams are um we we've seen that god uses dreams to communicate his message in the passage job 33 verses 14 and 18 you know the way god says that in a dream in a vision of the night when deep sleep falls upon men while slumbering on their beds then he opens the ears of men you know again the spirit when you hear ears the spirit of men and seals their instruction so he puts a word in their spirit is what we understand here so what are dreams you know we talked about visions visions are uh, from the spirit we perceive visually the message of god that is a vision uh, and so we use the term see okay and and people who see visions as seers so dreams can simply be called as visions of the night one sleeps they have this this uh, you know the the message being released to them so generally dreams are known as visions of the night when someone is sleeping you know god speaks to them uh, in different ways uh, and yeah they they perceive god's message and there are lots of examples of dreams in uh, the bible many people had dreams Uh, people of god and people who did not know god the people who did not know god is like abimelech uh, pharaoh uh, you know and uh, nebuchadnezzar like all these people had they were able to perceive what god was saying and then again you had god's people so you had jacob um, uh, you know you you had um, um, solomon having a dream so daniel 
so god's people so god uses dreams to speak to people can an unbeliever have a dream from god yes they can have a dream from god uh, there can also be um, you know something known as trances trances are when uh, people have a vision they are conscious but for a moment they are no longer in control of their you know physical body or or their physical senses that is known as a trance um and uh, there are examples of that as well so dream is usually when somebody is sleeping okay? they they hear from god and in a dream uh, we tend to have uh, a dream needs interpretation okay it needs interpretation there is a lot of symbolism involved in dreams and uh, sometimes we notice that the things that we perceive in the dream have a self contained meaning okay for example if you see an iron pillar we would all automatically say strength okay? even in jeremiah 118 iron pillar that's mentioned so iron pillar strength strong so that's the way we would interpret it but then there are symbols that we are not very sure of also okay so um, a good example is good figs in scripture if we don't know the passages and don't understand then we will like what figs what figs am i seeing in my dream it refers to israel it refers to god's people so uh, or the jewish captives representing jewish captives so if we don't have that understanding then we will not know how to interpret it so there can be symbols in our dreams some which we can they have what we call a self contained meaning so the moment you you see that you know you know oh, okay you know breeze like if there's a breeze then you know oh, okay um uh, soothing calm peaceful we get the meaning but if there's something else that you see then you know you're not sure a leaf uh, you're like okay what leaf is this what is tr god trying to say so then you will have to work on it a little bit to get the meaning so i'll just quickly share a few pointers uh, for how to interpret a dream always use biblical symbolism because there's a lot of books out there that are from the occult there are new age symbols and uh, you know psychology and mysticism and all those kind of books out there so the right way to interpret dreams is through biblical symbols um yeah sometimes symbols will be found in scripture sometimes it will not be found in scripture for example the car that i mentioned yesterday so the there is a car in the bible so at times like that when a symbol is not in the bible we also have to hear from the holy spirit or the spirit of god uh, and we have to expect the release of other gifts of the spirit word of knowledge discerning of spirits you know word of wisdom to interpret that uh, dream okay sometimes the what we see is literal and sometimes it is symbolic for example if i if i see a teacher in my dream you know maybe um, Uh, miss philomena it could be miss philomena or it she could be representing wisdom knowledge understanding instruction so uh, it can be interpreted both ways so the symbol can be literal exactly that person something about miss philomena i need to pray for her or it can be god is talking to me about equipping so uh, Uh, we run out of time what i'll do is i'll close right here and then we will uh, try and complete this chapter in the next class and the remaining chapters you know we've covered most of that content in many of our discussions so i'll be going over them very very quickly uh, so then we will be able to finish understanding the prophetic and then move on to the apostolic so let's just uh, pray and close right now mm. uh, subhajit uh, is it possible for you to pray please I'm not sure. Uh, maybe Christopher. Ah uh, yes, sorry, Miss Pastor. Yes, thank you. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for for the time we spent today uh, in this class. 
and what we have learned about the uh, prophetic uh, ministry. Uh, we ask you to continue to bless us, give us all your grace. Um, let us have a blessed, a blessed day uh, going forward. We thank you for looking after us, keeping us in good health, uh, being with us throughout the day. Uh, we ask your continued blessing and grace on everyone who's attended this class today, even those who have not, not been able to attend the class. We ask you to, um, we ask for your continued presence in our lives in whatever we are doing. And um, we ask this in, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, everyone, for uh, joining in. Please pray that God will give more dreams. Okay. Uh, and yeah, of course, communicate in other ways as well. So God bless you. We will meet again next week. Thank you.